Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Into the Bytecode. Today I sat down with Pedro Gomes, the co-founder and CEO of Wallet Connect, the open source protocol that connects wallets and applications. So in this conversation, we talked about a bunch of interesting topics. We talked about Wallet Connect V2 and how the Wallet Connect protocol is architected under the hood. We talked about Ethereum's public key infrastructure and why it could be one of its most meaningful contributions to the larger world, independent of what people are doing on chain. And lastly, we also talked about account abstraction and why Pedro believes it might be the most critical bottleneck towards the larger scale adoption of crypto. There were some super interesting ideas here. I'm still personally thinking through their ramifications and I think they could also be a source of inspiration for other builders in this space. And so with that, I'll leave you to it. We incorporated the company in April, 2021. So this is like a one year and three months old company. Wow. And now we just hired our 23rd person. So we're now 23, already looking at 24 by the end of the month uh, and likely going to be almost 30 by the end of the year. No. Wild. So all leading up to 2021, it was just kind of an unincorporated open source project on GitHub yes. that you are working on. Yes. So I started working on it. Uh, so I was at Balance. Uh, there, it was this wallet. Yeah. And yeah. we were building like the Balance portfolio and the Balance wallet. And essentially, it was just really annoying that we had like these two products that couldn't talk to each other. So it was just really a self-serving initiative at first of like, how can we connect two products that we own other than using MetaMask? And Wallet Connect kind of solved that problem for us. And then I applied to the Ethereum Foundation grant to make mm. it as a like a open source thing that's like a shared protocol and everything. And that's when I uh, spinned off of Balance. So I was working at Balance full-time, then I dedicated myself full-time to Wallet Connect, that was in 2018. And after that, I basically just got to know Ethereum very differently because it's very different when you're building a wallet and it's very different when you're building an open source project. You just become as almost like this piece of Ethereum that everyone uses and it just kind of have to kind of walk into different projects. And I got to learn a lot at that stage. Seems like seems like quite a beautiful way to engage with the larger ecosystem. Like not yeah. in a way that most people get to do it because you're you're really like there's there's nothing in this for me. I'm just trying to help the ecosystem and co be collaborative and positive some. I I think I I benefited from it so much because I got to learn things that I wouldn't be able to learn if I was a DApp or a wallet. Yeah, uh, because I remember. If you were, were a wallet, other wallets don't want to talk to you because you are a competitor, but you would still have a good relationship with dApps. Uh, but then even from dApp sides, there was always like this understanding of like, how can we get more users from a specific wallet? Uh, I like to see it almost as uh, you have users, but I have reasons for users to use ethereum and that's essentially what this two-sided market looks like is dApps give users reasons to use ethereum and wallets enable users to use ethereum so they both have like power or leverage in this uh, economy and this relationship is what made wallet connect really interesting because then i had to kind of bridge these relationships finding overlap between dApps that wanted users and wallets that wanted more interactions for users to actually engage on Ethereum. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You've been working on Wallet Connect 2.0. I'm, I'm curious if you could kind of sketch out how, like when you started thinking about this, what, a, what the motivation behind the V2 has been. I mean, when you work on something like Wallet Connect, you're talking to thousands of projects every day and you hear feedback from left and right. Obviously, you start like uh, digesting a wish list that everyone has. And Wallet Connect 2.0 almost started with just that. It's just the idea that 
there's a lot that needs to be changed, but there's also a moving train that you can't stop. And you have to basically make a smooth transition into like a much better, faster, and more comfortable train to ride on uh, without actually stopping the momentum. And I've been like working on Wallet Connect 2.0 since 2020. And that's when I met my co-founder, Sebastian, that we mm -hmm. started working on it. Uh, so I was working solo until then. And then 2020, we got some grants and we started working on it. The first things that we addressed was basically performance and reliability. Sure, I'm very happy with how well I connect version one turned out. But once you actually hit a certain scale that we have now, like having 0.6% missed messages doesn't seem a lot. But when you have like 15 to 20 K messages per second, that's actually a lot of messages getting lost. So yeah, uh, we fixing, addressing those was the first thing like message delivery, uh, was introduced. Uh, so we basically guarantee that messages are sent and received. Maybe, maybe just taking a step back. Can you also give like a, sh a description of what wallet connect is for people who might not be as familiar with it? For sure. So Wallet Connect, uh, like I said in the beginning, connects uh, wallets to an application. And that's how it started solving the problem between at my previous job to connect a wallet to the main app. And there was no solution out there because it was just considered that the standard was everyone is going to download the Chrome extension on the desktop browser and just mm. call it a wallet. And I just didn't think that was the way things were going to go. I think that five years ago and today, like it's obvious that like mobile first is not just something that you say it as a buzzword for corporate, but it's actually a reality. Like m most people nowadays use their phone without even using a desktop and some of them don't even own it. So if we make this experience of Ethereum to be desktop focused, then we're basically siloing like the majority of the world from using it. So Walknik added the ability that you could connect a mobile wallet to your desktop. Uh, and then eventually it became a mobile wallet to your mobile browser. So within your mobile phone, you could open anything on your Safari or Chrome and just visit Ethereum and then connect your wallet. And it wouldn't be actually exclusive to any wallet. And it would actually be supported by hundreds of wallets like it is today. Yeah. It's quite a magical experience the first time you try it. Like you almost like, it's like, whoa, what just happened? Like, how did my phone connect to this app? And then you can sign messages and whatnot. It's really cool. Yeah, I, I think that the reason for that is because I tried to develop the experience first. I just kind of like wrote down on paper what I would like to see it happen from the user's perspective. And then I kind of just reversed engineer of how we would actually work at the technical level. And I think that's something that I try to convey to the Wall Connect team a lot is that like you don't develop the technology and then you develop the experience. You do the experience first and then you just work really hard for the technology to match it and take any any efforts possible to make the user comfortable because it's all about the user experience. That's what Wall Connect strives for and the interoperability is technically part of the user experience. I think that sometimes we advertise interoperability and decentralization as something as ethical and almost political, but it's honestly a user experience feature because hmm. if it works anywhere and everywhere, then anyone will be more than happy to use that technology. Whereas if, if it's not there, you'd, you'd feel you'd have to jump through a bunch of other hoops to be able to use an application. Um, I think we can actually draw some parallels. Like if you think about uh, loyalty cards, uh, where right. you go to a shop and it says, oh, you could have a discount if you have loyalty card A, and then you go to another shop, oh, you could also have this one if you had loyalty card B, and yeah. you just think, why can't I use loyalty card A? And you just use that, you know? Yeah. I think that's how Wallet Connect kind of looks like. It's like if you go to different applications on Ethereum, they shouldn't have like different wallets. Like they just should work with whatever wallet I just happen to choose. And yeah, we almost end up building this team of ambassadors, which is different wallets 
bringing more people to Ethereum for different reasons with different experiences, but they all end up enjoying the same ecosystem that we built. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool that this was built. And I know that there's like a path dependence to how these things develop. And the fact that Wallet Connect existed from these early days is definitely a very positive thing for the ecosystem. It also makes me think to, you know, the fact that some wallets and applications can't interoperate because of this whole like account abstraction thing. And the fact that a lot of applications expect signatures to look a certain way. And that like really sucks. Like I would have been using a smart contract wallet all day, every day, but I can't because most applications on L1 don't, uh, don't understand them. I think that I, I have tweeted quite a lot about this and I don't know if you just did your research really well, but like uh, account <laughs> abstraction, I don't know why it's being overlooked so much because we could be literally unlocking a billion users right away if it was implemented on the Ethereum protocol, uh, just at the opcode level, it, it should just be part of what it means to use Ethereum rather than having these whole companies developing smart contract wallets and trying to hack away like a good user experience for something that should be just solved by Ethereum itself. And I, it's probably the biggest blocker to mainstream adoption. And I, I love the merge. I think it's highly necessary, but like as soon as we get done with the merge, I hope that this there's is the some prioritization priority. with the account of abstraction. Yeah. And the reason why this matters, like how do you, why is this important? Like, I guess partially, like one of the reasons why I think it's a major blocker to mainstream adoption is that in the absence of account abstraction, you basically users have to make this choice and either have to like in terms of how they're custodying their like their keys and their crypto and either they have to trust some custodian um, that will give them an easy to use like user experience and they don't have to deal with keys like and that's i mean that's like 98 percent of the population like even some days i'm like how how the hell am i like using these like hardware yeah. wallets and like how's this all secure this is like insane at some level uh or the yeah, user yeah. has to basically go in that direction and be like yeah i'm gonna like store a mnemonic like engrave it on metal and put it in a bank vault and yeah, account yeah. abstraction like lets you build uh lets you be more much more flexible about how these keys how, how a key maps to the idea of an account and allow them to be swapped in and out allow like third parties to hold like you know keys that can that can act on your behalf and whatnot so that's like one where my mind goes of like why this is so critical is because like managing keys is really difficult for the average person in the world. I mean, the easiest way to describe this is that uh, any protocol developer will also try to find where to draw the line, right? Uh, Ethereum is not going to cure rare diseases, right? That's the line that we draw, obviously. Like, what is Ethereum? Where does the line stop where Ethereum has significant uh, power? And we know that it's going to provide security over transactions. We know it's going to provide security over uh, block history. But what if it actually provided security over key management, right? This is something that in the initial design was kind of ruled out. I and mean, we just assume that either people are going to know how to manage a seed phrase or they're just going to rely on a custodian. And that was kind of something that if you just don't give a platform to actually have better private key management, people are just going to use the most convenient one rather than the hard one. And I think that's something that per, the protocol, the Ethereum protocol should actually take ownership and actually control and say, wait a minute, we could actually have a diversity of private key management solutions going from the hardware, hardware wallet to the custodian, but a bunch of intermediary solutions, which we call account abstraction, that allowed you to actually make it easier to be both secure, but also have convenience. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can actually have a spectrum 
of security and convenience and not just have to go like zero one hundred. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting kind of flipping this on its head. Like the way you described it makes me think that we could even think of the public key the, the public key infrastructure as like almost like a public good in the world. And Ethereum can facilitate the world's population having and managing keys in a secure way. Like this could actually be a this is like a very this would be a huge deal if if yeah. blockchains facilitated this it would be it's like on par with um it's like a prerequisite for all this other stuff that we're trying to do but even independent of all the payments and the nfts and all this other stuff like it would be a very very valuable thing for the world if each person had like keys um yeah and i mean most it's... distributed systems like need private key management in some form instead of them reinventing the wheel they could just leverage the existing account abstraction on ethereum and actually basically ethereum wouldn't just be uh, a safe place for transactions of high value it would actually be a safe place for key management for completely non-financial use cases yeah like you would literally just decide a bunch of keys that are held by a community by using a multi-sig on ethereum rather than you just developing your own solution because you don't have an option and with account yeah. abstraction we're basically building that platform it's ethereum is essentially not just settlement but it's also private key management yeah and in the absence of a protocol layer thing each application like each you know non-crypto application that relies on private keys needs to kind of roll out their own system uh, similar to how you know we we're talking about apps building wallets in inside the browser like if if i don't know if like you could sign a docusign document uh without you know like where where are my keys like how's that even working <laughs> you know yeah, exactly. or even credit cards at some level like why is there a three digit thing on the back that secures uh you know yeah, yeah, yeah. it's massive balance like uh, this is all crazy. And this is all downstream of people not having keys, basically. Exactly. And I think we at least should be grateful that the cryptocurrency created this craze that now we have more private keys in the hands of people that we ever had in the past. Like if you go back to even Bitcoin, nobody actually managed private keys. So if you see any history of private key management solutions, the closest thing that we've gotten was PGP and it yeah. was a complete failure, you know, like uh, this is like what we consider anything non-cryptocurrency related that actually got into some scale. Yeah. Why was PGP a failure? Well, because PGP relied on the fact that you actually had to exchange public keys in some form. Right. And in order to do that, it was extremely inconvenient because... A, you either have to in person like exchange them and verify them, uh, which nobody's going to do, or you just go the full centralized custodian way and you just have this ledger of public keys and say, for Pedro, you have this public key. And then you ended up just, what are you doing? Uh, it just kind of loses the whole purpose, like the idea of like PGP key servers. So. Yeah, you know it. It it's essentially the same problem with like Ethereum not having accounts abstraction. You either do it the hardcore way, where you have to be really diligent about how you manage your keys, or you have the super convenient way, which is so centralized and so custodial that then you kind of lose the purpose of actually having private keys. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess the PGP analog would in how it works in the crypto world is that the blockchain's like state and like the, the accounts that exist and like ENS as a like narrower, you know, s registry, like similar in a similar way, those are, those, that's like basically where you can look to figure out what someone's key is to encrypt a and message the, for them. And the biggest problem is that then PGP didn't have any form of consensus. So, uh, a, a registry of keys in one place didn't mean it matched the other place. So what meant that Pedro's key was on 
A was different than B. So then you didn't even know if which key was the right one. So that's what blockchains actually solved. So you see, yeah. there's a plenty of opportunity for Ethereum as probably the most widely used yeah. blockchain or distributed technology on earth to actually build at the protocol level private key management that could impact like society. Yeah. Well, maybe to tie this into Wallet Connect, one of the like Wallet Connect 2.0, which will, uh, I guess we'll jump around a bit, but one of the APIs that you have is this auth uh, endpoint, right? Which basically allows a user, al allows like a wallet and an application to do this handshake of basically I hold this key and I can sign messages with it, which means that it can be used for all these sorts of applications. Exactly. So I think one of the biggest uh, changes with Wallet Connect version two is almost this modular approach where we essentially build so many infrastructure and tooling to connect a wallet remotely and sign transactions. And then we realize that there's so much more potential there and we built four APIs. So sign where you can actually sign transactions remotely that you had in V1, but then three new ones, uh, which is the chat API, where you can actually send encrypted messages between users. Uh, the auth API, where you can actually have a one-click login into any website or application. And then the push API that would allow you to send push notifications directly to your wallet based on your accounts on the blockchain. But the auth API that you were mentioning, I think it's gonna be quite a huge one because we already seen use cases where Wallet Connect was being used by traditional tech tech or Silicon Valley companies like Meta or uh, Twitter and even Discord had an announcement and Stripe, they all use Wallet Connect with the primary purpose of verifying wallet ownership. And we ended up seeing this wow. use case that was so apparent that people just wanted to authenticate themselves with their wallet. So why not build a dedicated API that has some limitations, but it specializes itself in probably what is probably going to be the most used one, which is logging in with your wallet. Yeah, I know this is an idea that Vitalik's also, again, talked about for some time of this idea of like login with Ethereum, um, which is this, this like awesome thing that we have in the crypto space where you can literally log into any of the websites with the same account. You don't have to make different accounts. And it's analog in the web two world is logging in with Gmail or with Facebook. So this is like providing another option in that list of login with your Ethereum account. And yes. if someone clicks on that, then, you know, wallet connect would be one of the, one of the options there, which is like, we don't actually care which, like where your Ethereum identity or your, you know, crypto identity is like stored where these keys are. You can, you can rely on the same like network of wallet connect integrations to basically just connect it to whatever wallet you use. This exactly. is a super cool idea. Yeah. I, I think it will make a lot of sense because it, it essentially builds this bridge, not, not so much a technological bridge, but like a, a social bridge where we start actually understanding that cryptocurrency and this whole like a system actually lives beyond the tra the trading and the finance and even the nfts and the DAOs. like all of the speculation has created so much um prejudice sometimes against web3 and with the login with ethereum we essentially bridging the two worlds where the people who are not so fans of crypto can actually start getting accustomed to the fact that actually you could take advantage of this from a user experience perspective where you just make your life easier. Yeah. Have you seen early applications that use this paradigm that, that you think are interesting? Well, I think that for starters, so what we're seeing is a very simple implementation of just signing a message, uh, verifying ownership of an account gives you some benefits because you can now associate centralized accounts like on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter with some activity that you've done on the blockchain. But I think what is going to start looking more interesting is 
when they're actually used as the primary way of actually authenticating themselves into these applications. In the past, you could just generate new email accounts, but what if you could actually just generate a new wallet account? Uh, hmm. It's not just a more ephemeral or easier way of generating accounts, but it's also an easier way of managing accounts because you no longer have to remember your password to your email to recover your accounts. You only thing you need is to manage your wallet. Hmm. So the idea would be that I want to log into this new like web two service. Uh, I don't know this new like events ticketing platform that I've never used before. And yes. I could either link my existing like ENS name, uh, my wallet with my ENS address in it, or I could like go on my wallet, like go on Rainbow or whatever, and like create a new address, link it to them right away, and then just start using that and know that I can later go back in my wallet and look at all the permissions I've given out, like where I'm off, like all these sorts of things. Yeah, I think that we have kind of been building our phones to be almost these passports or personal devices that control our lives. But yeah. we can even take a step further and they could actually even control the permissions remotely to everything that we've interacted. So we could keep a very close uh, relationship with any interaction that we built with the product or service and manage it from your phone because Right now, email has kind of built this, and I think we can even take a much closer control with wallets because they actually embedded cryptography into this. So it will be cryptographically secure that these relationships are under your control because you hold the private keys rather than you own an email account on some centralized company. Yeah. And... Like if you in like putting ourselves into this new world, let's say we're using our phones with wallets on them to log into everything. They're really our digital like passports. What happens if I lose my phone? Then I guess, I guess like it relies on this idea of account abstraction, hopefully by that point where you have some other key that's in a much more secure place and you can go and use that thing to move the move, like take over take control of the wallet again yeah so wallet connect is trying to improve the wallet experience as the wallet right so as a piece of software or application that you download on your phone and makes your life easier but these wallets are still designed in the same way that the blockchains actually enable them to work so without the count abstraction, there's only a few things the wallet can, can improve because at the end of the day, the private key management solutions right now are basically seed phrases, smart contract wallets, or custodians. Uh, we really have only three mechanisms today to actually build wallets. And with account abstraction, we can improve this dramatically because we can have a bigger diversity where you can actually tweak between convenience and security at a more granular level rather than being all or nothing. Yeah. So maybe going back to this Wallet Connect story, so you were saying a uh, message like reliability and whatnot was getting hard. And then, yes. yeah. Uh, I think that Few people understand that like under under the hood, Wallet Connect is essentially a messaging network. And basically we just ended up building what it looks like as a dedicated WhatsApp or signal for wallets. And we it, what we did was we created an end-to-end -end encrypted chat where the only parties that talked in that chat was an application and a wallet. And in that conversation, they talked about hey, I'm this application, I want to talk to your wallet. And the wallet say, hey, I'm this wallet, I have these accounts. And then the conversation just goes on as you have this interaction right. between the application and the wallet. So it, this was very interesting when I developed in the first time because essentially what I was building was to be used on top of Whisper, which was the messaging network that Ethereum was working on. But then as Whisper didn't get worked as much 
as I wish it was, I ended up building what I called like a, almost as an emulator, which was a centralized service that looked like Whisper, but it wasn't Whisper, and it just behaved in the same way. And I'm glad I did that because four years later, Whisper project got completely shut down and Status uh, then built a similar project called Waco. But as we as we increased our requirements as a company, we realized that like all of these millions of connections require a degree of performance reliability that not even Whisper or Waco could actually offer. So we ended up building our own solution, uh, which we call Walla Connect Network today. Uh, it's only centralized controlled by us. Uh, we have essentially an internal network and the goal in the future is actually to federate it with other node operators and we're trying to do this rollout very smoothly over the next three years so that we ensure that we don't compromise on the user experience. Uh, we want to make sure that we have distributed ourselves as a service, but still maintaining that good experience that people have kind of relied on as a seamless experience to connect your wallet. Yeah. Interesting. So you're, you're not using Waku anymore. You've built something new. Yes, so we built almost as a, if, you, if you're familiar with Matrix, uh, Matrix yeah. is this decentralized slash federated uh, chat system that it does some things really nicely, but then Waku does other things that does it very nicely. And we basically just had a baby created between Matrix <laughs> and Waku. Uh, we just have like this intermediate where it just sits really nicely in between the two, but it it does not become compatible with either. Uh, we we just call it Wall Connect Network now. I think I think it deserves its own name, honestly, uh, because I think Wall Connect as an end user facing product makes a lot of sense. But this network could in the future be used for other purposes and not just Wall Connect. Yeah. Uh, can you maybe just because it's interesting to understand the system a bit more, just sketch out like the, the 80, 20 of how the network works? Like what is the architecture of it? What are, what are so, like the, the highest order bits of how it works? The, fi the first thing that we, we developed is the idea that there's no such thing as full node operators on the mobile phone. And the whole system had to basically be built as light clients uh, by design. Uh, it's something that like blockchain blockchain designers usually don't take into consideration as a priority because they obviously are securing millions of dollars and billions of dollars in transactions when they're building smart contract blockchains. But for a messaging network, building light, light clients was the priority. But we also wanted to make sure that these light clients were not how do I say this? Um, they remove the liability of depending on the full node operators as much. So mm -hmm. this is something that I I believe that the matrix uh, the matrix system is solving, but mm -hmm. they haven't solved yet. Which is, you as a light client have delegated your power to one of the full node operators, but then if you change full node operator, you basically wiped out your whole experience and you have to start from scratch. Hmm. And this causes a liability on the light clients because that means that if a full They're node operator costs. becomes malicious, yes, yeah. the switching costs are so high that you basically are at the hands of the full node operator. So with the Wall Connect network, we made the switching costs between light clients between full node operators as smooth as possible because then that actually puts a liability in the full node operators to actually create the best experience possible because then the light clients would just choose to switch. Right? Yeah. So there's an incentive there for you to provide the best service possible. Otherwise all the light clients would switch to another full node operator with like as easy as that. And so I guess, I guess the, 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 it's, it's, it's a simpler problem than building a blockchain network is because each, each end, each end user or account only cares about the slice of the states that has to do with their own, with yes. their own sessions. Right. So you could almost think of it as like thing. as a sharded blockchain. Right. And each user is on its own shard basically. 
exactly like uh, we call it mailboxes because it was okay. just an easier term <laughs> uh, so it, each each light client has its own mailbox so for each mailbox you only care about your mailbox it's not like you're keeping state for other light clients mailboxes so the full node operator then only cares about the mailboxes of its own light clients it doesn't care about the light clients on other full node operators so that kind of like shards the state that like full node operators are also not keeping the state of like mailboxes of users that they do not know. Uh, it kind of almost uh, replicates uh, what IPFS does with pinning services. Mm -hmm. uh, so where you could consider like full node operators basically pinning mailboxes of their peers, you know? Yeah. And then how does this, are you using the same network for the chat API or is that like, because that's a case where users do care about other people. Or is that like happening on some other data storage layer? And this is like the the kind of, I don't know, the the registry and the permissioning layer of it is happening on, on, the, on the network. So this is an interesting question because uh, we actually describe this as very different problems, right? Because a mailbox in the context of the Wallet Connect network is actually described as undelivered messages and delivered messages are considered to be the responsibility of the light client. Uh, so a light client would then have the responsibility to choose its own backup solution or even a uh, provider uh, mm. for the already delivered messages. And the Wallet Connect network would only be responsible to deliver any messages while the party was offline. Got it. So yes, so Wallet Connect sign off chat and push, the four APIs are built on top of the same Wallet Connect network. So they have very strong assumptions about how ephemeral these mailboxes exist. Yeah. Uh, you could see these messages being cached from a couple of hours to a full week, but they're not expected to kind of retrieve a full history of messages that happened within the last six months. Yeah. It's like it's a stateless protocol, similar to how HTTP exactly. is stateless. It doesn't know like anything about the past. Yeah. It's like a stateless protocol with some caching mechanisms that have limitations. Got it. Got it. Okay. So a big part of the design is this idea of light clients and being able to switch between full nodes with relative ease. Yes, so basically light clients uh, would register to a full node and the full node would be responsible for uh, sending and receiving messages on their behalf. And then the other interesting part is about how the full node uh, operators actually exchange messages. Uh, there is uh, a very common thing in distributed systems, which is gossip uh, as a mechanism. So Waku and Whisper both use gossip by default. And that's very useful when you want to reach consensus over a large set of operators. But then in the case of Wall Connect Network, every conversation usually has two, maybe three participants, but never more than that. So having gossip actually becomes disadvantages because it only becomes interesting to use gossip if you had like 10 plus participants listening to the same messages. So what mm. we did instead was gossip would then be used to understand how messages are going to be routed, but then mm. you actually route the messages on a single hop from sender to recipient uh, node operators. Interesting. So you're figuring out like what, what like the IP address of, of like a receiver is through these like multiple handshakes potentially with like servers in the middle holding like incomplete registry. So they might give you the answer more quickly, but then the actual messages are just happening one-to-one -one between these servers. Exactly. It, it, that's exactly right. It's essentially yeah. the full node operators maintain almost what it looks like as a, a, a DNS. Uh, for yeah, the messages right. and they just reach consensus over this DNS uh, or distributed hash table. And then they essentially read the distributed hash table and they route the message directly to the recipient rather than gossiping the message across uh, all nodes. Wow. Crazy. 
<laughs> it's a whole new protocol. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, I, and I think that there is definitely a lot of space for other protocols when it comes to messaging, because when we looked at Waku, Waku was a generalized messaging protocol, and it definitely fits that bill. Like it's a general purpose messaging network. While in WallConnect, we had a very specific user experience that we wanted to achieve. And in order to achieve that, we had to take some compromises. Like this is not a good system for 10 people to listen to the same messages, right? It's just not designed for that. But if you had a single sender and a single recipient, then this design becomes way more performant and reliable for that. You're not going to wait almost up to a second for a message. It's going to look like milliseconds because you have direct routes being agreed upon by the network. So when a sender, a uh, light client sends to the its node, it will route directly to the recipient's node. So the message would not take longer than 300 to 500 milliseconds. Mm. Do you see other, uh, other types of use cases that might benefit from the same network? I guess where my mind goes is they're, they're kind of out of style nowadays, but like state channels feels like something that has a similar type model. We could, we could see either state channels or any other one-to-one -one protocols take advantage of the Wallet Connect network. Uh, that's yeah. why we co completely decoupled the Wallet Connect network with the Wallet Connect APIs uh, so that they could be used for other purposes. Uh, Another purpose that was actually proposed by one of the wallets was actually to do syncing between wallets where mm. a user could actually own the same wallets on two devices or even on a mobile and a desktop and would like to synchronize the state between the two. Mm -hmm. And this would be completely off-chain state, maybe something private where they would like to keep some profiles and some contact lists or an address book and they would like to have that synchronized across its devices but they don't want to use a centralized service like iCloud or something from Google and they would actually use the network to broadcast uh, these messages between devices so they would actually synchronize between themselves that whenever you change a setting on your phone it also changes on your desktop yeah Okay, that makes sense. So it's this like stateless protocol. These full nodes are finding each other through this kind of DNS-like system, finding each other's yes. locations, sending messages one on back and forth, and um, and once the message arrives, there there could be some caching and whatnot. But then it's it's the responsibility of the user and other third parties they use to kind of maintain a history of what's happened. Exactly. Yes, that's what we introduced last week on FCC. Yeah. How has it been like building this thing? It feels like a different sort of an animal than the APIs <laughs> or like the, the what you've worked on in the past. I mean, I, I I almost feel like we built something modular for the sake of composability but it almost feels like they're just variations of the same thing. You yeah. know, like what we build with the sign API for the last four years has been built on top of this idea of a publish and subscribe server that we managed and then building a network that could essentially do that as a federation rather than as a centralized server uh, was a very small evolution uh, I think the biggest concerns was we needed to make a lot of decisions about what's right and wrong. Uh, I think that's the biggest uh, challenge that I faced is just sometimes it's not about the right answer. You just have to have one, you know, having one is better than having the perfect one and making sure that we're pragmatic. is something that we value a lot. It's better to have something that's 80% good today than 90% like two years from now. And if we keep that kind of move fast and break things kind of energy, like we can deliver more valuable because if I knew how hard it would have been to build Wallet Connect when I started, I probably wouldn't have started. 
Yeah. Uh, and it was because I was naive enough to even start that we have this very beautiful ecosystem and this amazing public good that allowed this experience that people enjoy today. And I think we need to be experimental and take shortcuts in some places just to fit the user experience. We need to enable people to use wallets more easily. And sometimes you need to build imperfect solutions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really resonate with that. It's something I've had to learn over the years as well with various projects I've worked on. It's particularly interesting in the context of like designing protocols because I feel like they have a lot of inertia to them once they're out there, especially if there's multiple stakeholders. Um, so it's like you have to balance being like thoughtful and trying to look around corners with shipping and just like moving forward at some level. Um, it also makes me think of this whole account abstraction thing again, right? Which is, I think like Ethereum did a really good job with shipping something in the very beginning, you know, that yes. the V2, ETH2 has been more like, what is like, we know how hard it is to upgrade these systems. So let's try to like figure out, let's try to be build the best version of it possible. But the first version is like, literally just like, what are the different pieces? What is like the 80, 20 on all of them, the best we can do. Um, yeah. And then it's crazy that like six, seven years later, we have the same kind of like, we're using the same infrastructure. So yeah, it, it's really interesting in that way. Yeah. I honestly also get impressed that the Wallet Connect V1 is even being used today. I was <laughs> yeah. I was expecting it to be like a temporary solution and not yeah. like to have production traffic at this scale for four years in a row. Like yeah. so it, it just shows how valuable it was for Ethereum to just start and not have to wait for it to be perfect, you know? Yeah. But then they also should not forget that just because they started and they have all of these stakeholders that then you shouldn't change it. I mean, yeah. and it, it all ends up being extremely political. I, I've i participated in a lot of EIPs and even became an author of a few. And you just really have to pull strings uh, wherever you can. And this account abstraction is going to look exactly like that. If you look at the EIP 1559 with the gas market changes, uh, that's something that we could easily say that would never would have happened, but then it just had the correct people involved. And that kind of just like took off dramatically, had a lot of funding, had a lot of political support in multiple sides. And account abstraction just needs to find that like same drive politically. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild that EIP 1559 happened. It's like yeah. the biggest change. Um, yes. And honestly, if you think about it, it's another place where a protocol has decided that before we drew the line that the Ethereum protocol did not decide on the gas. It was the community. It was kind of just organically decided. And then they realized that it was just uh, too easy to gamify it. So now the protocol took ownership as now this is my responsibility to understand what price of the gas it should be. And that's how it actually uh, became easier to transact. And I think that's the same thing that's going to be with account abstraction. The difference is that there's not so much economic gain from account abstraction right. other than indirect economic gain. While with the IP 1559, with burning the gas, there was a lot of political support because obviously that would reduce the issuance of Ethereum. So therefore existing stakeholders were motivated to fund it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. It was like at the, at the, you know, user at the like edge, you know, the larger sphere of people who care about Ethereum, it did hook into the notion of like, we're going to decrease the supply. You're all going to make yeah. money. This is like good. Um, yeah. And I wonder what the similar, I mean, for account abstraction, like there is this like very uh, intense burning pain point of like dealing with keys. Like, I feel like this is something everyone, everyone who uses Ethereum agrees that this sucks and like is, yeah. so maybe that's what, that's like the emotional hook to like really, to really go after. Well, 
Yeah, I think emotional hooks can have an impact, but uh, economical hooks have even more. Yeah. So maybe one more thing to talk about is the chat, the Wallet Connect chat, because that's also something you've talked about more recently. So yeah, what is, how do you think about that? Like why, why did you build chat? The reason we built chat was because uh, we were already doing chat. Uh, the only difference is that we essentially opened up almost like this API on an existing infrastructure where before we had a very specialized chat where you had the wallet and the app talking about a very specific conversation, which was mm. exchanging accounts and signing transactions. And then we realized if you have 150 wallets all connected to the same network, why are they not allowing their users to chat between each other? Yeah. And that's essentially how the whole conversation came because what was that the moment biggest... like? That feels like a galaxy brain, like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> like the, everything shatters and you see a new reality. I think I think the biggest realization was realizing that big wallets like even MetaMask and status and like Rainbow and Trust Wallet, all of them wanted this, but nobody wanted to do the first step. And the reason they didn't want to do the first step is because they didn't just want to become the same thing as every other Web2 project where everyone just has their proprietary chat solution that they now maintain and it's used only for their segment of users. And ideally, they would like to see something just happen at an ecosystem level, something that was just assumed as a public good that we all share and it's not the trust wallet chat or the metamask chat or the rainbow chat or the, the status chat it's something that it's ethereum chat and we then realized that like wait a minute all of these stakeholders that we just listed very popular wallets are all using wallet connect so why are not they just chatting through the existing infrastructure that we already built we put so much effort into routing messages for the purpose of signing transactions, it takes zero effort to actually open up this API for end users to chat between each other. So we then shipped Wallet Connect chat based on that yeah. assumption. It's kind of interesting. It's one of these problems, these like uh, product ideas that people almost joke about of like building a chat application to yeah. unite, <laughs> to, to act as an inbox for all the other chat applications. And I know that this isn't going to, this is going to integrate with wallets rather than like Telegram and Discord and whatnot. But like that world could also be down the corner. You know, they could all... I guess similar to how Facebook united WhatsApp and Instagram and Messenger chat under the hood, this is like an open yeah. version of that. Well, the, that was also one of the realizations, right? Because if Meta could connect all of its products because they all share the same infrastructure, why can't Wallace, who all share the Wallet Connect infrastructure, do the same thing? Like they are, they're all connected now to the Wallet Connect network. They're just not using it. Maybe they're not even aware they could have used it. So we basically just enabled that as an API. Now it's up to them to actually introduce that as an experience to their users. And then eventually we will find it almost as a industry standard that if you have a wallet, you have a chat, you know, it's just yeah. something that it needs to be unlocked. And once it happens, it becomes just predominant and we just assume as this is a wallet feature that we yeah. expect everyone to have. So I, I kind of mentioned this uh, in our Telegram. I, I actually worked on a messaging project like in 2018 based on the same premise of like connect, like allowing wallets to like log in and then have their, have their handles be their addresses and build this communication layer on top of like on-chain behavior. Um, I'm curious, like, what, um, what do you, what do you think the world will look like once chat is woven into, woven into the fabric of this crypto ecosystem? Because it's it's really something that doesn't exist today. Like people are yeah. hacking around it in various ways. But what does the world look like post this existing? I think that 
we will not see as much private chat as we believe we're going to see. Like two end users exchanging messages through Wallet Connect chat won't be as common as businesses and apps and services actually chatting to their users. I think that Wallet oh, Connect chat will evolve to be a business slash support chat and even potentially almost as a bot chat feature. The reason for this is because normally people either have already mechanisms to chat to their peers, whether that's Telegram or WhatsApp or Discord, that have solved these problems. But businesses, products, and services usually are lacking on that area. And we've seen things like intercom, which mm -hmm. are good. But intercom is still very contextual over a single application. And in this case, we actually have a much wider context of a whole blockchain. You don't just know that this user used Uniswap. You right. know that this user used Uniswap, OpenSea, and some new app that just came out. And you have this whole understanding about who this is that you can actually engage a much more curated and tailored experience rather than what intercom has offered. Yeah. It's, I, I think a, a big part of it will also go in the direction of like customer acquisition, right? Cause now you have a direct yeah. channel to like all these users, you can qualify them based on their past behavior. And yeah. these like crypto products and protocols are literally spending like tens of millions of dollars on these liquidity mining programs that um, are so inefficient, I think, at acquiring users. They're not targeted at all. And you yeah. can put a fraction of that budget into a system like this. And basically like you can you can develop the, the equivalent of performance marketing, you know, where you're like, hey, we like nudge the user in this way and they had this behavior on chain after that. And I feel yeah. like that will just be like a whole space of things that, that will open up. And you could even have, uh, so one of the things that we made sure that Wall Connect chat was, it, it was fully opt-in. Uh, so a lot of yeah. people talk about we, how we can actually build spam protection. And there's still a lot of things to be thought about spam protection at the invite level so we have a invite system where you could actually make someone publicly discoverable and then invite them into a chat and we still do not have spam protection at that level but at least we have spam protection at the level that number one you by default are private so people can't find you you have to opt in into being public and number two the invite system uh, actually requires you to do key exchange with the inviter so that you can actually start chatting. So you could literally erase that conversation from a single message rather than getting spammed with a bunch of random messages and never receive a message from that participant anymore. So given that the person has opted in, we could build like bot experiences where you could have like almost these assistants and people get lost on Web3 a lot. And we could have like a wall connect chat experience where they a bot would detect that you failed your transaction, analyze yeah. it using some sort of like uh, chain analysis and understanding exactly what this transaction was trying to do, and then literally describe it in a message to the user. Hey, it looks like you tried to send to Uniswap, but you had a very short time window, or you had the the range yeah. wrong or something and literally explain to the user automatically as the failed transaction gets mined on the blockchain. Yeah. Wow, that's such a cool idea. Because it's it's yeah. also, it's like kind of an ecosystem support line, you know, that exactly. works across the applications. Because like, who do you go talk to if you're like, I guess like MetaMask and some of these folks just get the, get the brunt end of, all of these issues that users have, right? Or like, yeah. I think my Ether wallet back in the day would talk about all these like crazy support requests they get where they're like, yeah. we don't know, we didn't have anything to do with this. It's the application you're using or whatever. Exactly. And it, it, I like the fact that it's so 
uh, modular and interoperable because then it doesn't even need to be the actual wallet provider to provide this service. Maybe there's like some really good like chain, uh, like blockchain explorer, blockchain indexer company that builds like the the best support experience. So whether you're like on Trust Wallet, I'm Token, or Rainbow or MetaMask, you could take advantage of that service in all of these wallets by just subscribing to this bot, and then this bot just like helps you out regardless yeah. of the wallet that you use. Yeah, totally. Well, I, I feel like we've we've really traversed the space of of a lot of <laughs> ideas here, but I'm I'm super excited about the the future. I feel like you're you're kind of opening up just huge open spaces on multiple sides, like with the chat, with, with this like private public key infrastructure with the auth. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, I feel like we're very privileged because we never build an actual app or a wallet, but we actually get to receive feedback from both sides and understand everyone's problems. And then we just try to fix them. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It was great chatting about count abstraction and all the good stuff that Boss will have in the future.